Thank you, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, before I begin and to echo the comments already made, uh, please allow me to express my condolences on the passing of Representative Cummings. We recognize his historic place in this chamber and his long-standing service, including in this subcommittee. Our thoughts and prayers are with his family at this time. As for the business in front of us today, uh, China's Mar Mar uh, Maritime Silk Road is exactly the type of issue in which we need to communicate across traditional lines of effort uh, because of the unique China uh, challenge that China presents, echoing your comments. Uh, we welcome the chance to do so at this hearing. My remarks are going to focus on China's strategy and how the Department of Defense is supporting the whole of government competitive response. China's leaders certainly believe that they can and must contend for global leadership and a new era for socialism with Chinese characteristics, heralded uh, most authoritatively at the 19th Congress of the Communist Party of China in October of 2017. In the maritime domain, this means building China into a maritime great power, which the Chinese Communist Party made an official national priority at its 18th Party Congress as early as 2012. In 2017, President Xi Jinping linked this maritime great power status to China's goals for national rejuvenation by 2049. Maritime great power status includes access to resources, a developed maritime economy, and protect, uh, protection of perceived maritime rights and interests. This is well served by China's One Belt, One Road and Maritime Silk Road initiatives which focus on policy coordination and building transportation infrastructure globally to expand developmental ties to China. In this context, while we do not oppose China's contributions to high quality development based on international standards, we must recognize that China is also competing for strategic advantage. While in the past, China's leaders have disavowed any direct connection between OBOR or the One Belt, One Road and the People's Liberation Army or their security interest, there is clear evidence that this is changing. For example, China's 2019 National Defense White Paper identified the need to build China's far seas forces and a need for overseas logistics, uh, logistical facilities. In January of this year, President Xi Jinping called for the completion of a security system for OBOR to ensure the security of major overseas projects. In July, China's defense ministry, or excuse me, defense minister openly declared that China is willing to deepen military exchanges in cooperation with Caribbean and Pacific Island countries under the framework of OBOR. Finally, as an example, the PLA Navy has recently argued for a long-term strategy to obtain bases overseas using methods such as constructing, purchasing, and long-term leasing of foreign ports. Lieutenant General Talk will go into more detail on the military implications of China's activities, but I would like to quickly stress that OBOR projects could also increase countries, uh, other countries' exposures uh, to coercive pressure and affect the security of digital infrastructure as well. Overlapping with China's Maritime Silk Road is the 21st century digital Silk Road in which Chinese companies are building infrastructure in areas like 5G, fiber optic links, undersea cables, and infrastructure connected to satellite navigation. For example, this past June, Huawei, a Chinese company, announced an agreement with the Chinese, uh, a Chinese container operator, the sixth largest in the world, to establish a 5G innovation hub. Because China lacks an independent uh, judiciary and there are extensive security vulnerabilities in Huawei products, we are Concerned critical sectors could be vulnerable to China uh, links uh, as China links port developments with its technology exports and its diplomatic engagements. So how are we responding to this challenge? DOD's response is guided by our national defense strategy, which identifies great power competition as our principal priority. Increasing lethality and strengthening alliances and partnerships are a long-term undertaking uh, our long-term undertakings for competing with China, and I'm glad to be leading a new office within the Defense Department dedicated to assisting in this role. 
Critically, the National Defense Strategy also states that the Defense Department will support interagency approaches and work by, with, and through our allies and partners. The most important takeaway from our discussion is this. We need economic, diplomatic, and security efforts to respond to China's maritime Silk Road activities. DOD supports this whole of government response in three ways. First is by uh, that we, will, uh, we provide assessments to our interagency counterparts to identify which of China's investments have national security implications from the Maritime Silk Road. Second, we work to deepen security partnerships and underwrite stability, enabling economic and diplomatic tools to succeed. We don't seek to counter China dollar for dollar here, but to play to our strengths by promoting shared principles, developing high standard alternatives for acute needs, and working with our allies and partners hand in hand. Finally, we share best practices with other countries for engaging with China's military. We encourage carefully scoped defense engagements, hard discussions with the, on the risks of China's military presence, national security-based investment screening, and a risk-based security framework for issues like 5G. This helps build long-term principles-based approaches to address this risk. We welcome the subcommittee's continued attention to this is issue and look forward to your questions. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. General Tuck. Good afternoon.